Hello, my name is Jacqueline Ford. I am humbled and honored to have worked for the Department of Children and Families for over 25 years. And although I may be familiar with many of the topics I bring to you, I am inviting experts in those fields to share their knowledge. This week, we will speak with Matt Follin, USD2 Superintendent of Schools, and Nachi Biat, USD2 Educational Consultant. We will learn about the educational services offered to children affiliated with the Department of Children and Families. Welcome, Matt and Nachi. Thank you so much for joining us on Doors to Hope and Healing. Um, before we get started talking about what educational services we offer to the children affiliated with DCF, can we um, learn a little bit about both of you? I'll start with Matt. Okay. Well, thanks, Jackie, for having us here today uh, to talk about USD2. Um, my name is Matt Fall, and I came to DCF as superintendent of schools about a year and a half ago. Um, I came to DCF from Harvard Public Schools where I served as um, a principal of a, a magnet high school, an early college magnet high school at the University of Harvard, um, and held um, all, all titles and roles within uh, the education system in, in Harvard. So um, when the opportunity uh, presented itself, I thought it was a good fit for me, and uh, it's been a terrific experience serving the youth of, of Department of Children's and Families. Well, welcome to TCF. I'm Thank sure you. that's gone by very fast. Yes, it yes. has. It has. And Nachi? Thank you. First, yes, thank you for having us. It's really nice to be able to be here and talk about education services at the department. Uh, I've been with us. It'll be my 32nd year this uh, coming June. Um, my background is in uh, um, science education, special education, and uh, educational psychology. I started out as a teacher in, in our state psychiatric hospitals and uh, since moved to regional con consultation and I've been uh, out in the regions for uh, about 15 years now. Well, it's, it's great to have you both here. So let's start with what is Unified School District 2? I know we refer to it internally as USD2, um, using a lot of jargon at DCF. Can you talk about what that actually means? Yes, so USD2 is, um, it is an education district in the, in the state of Connecticut, just as it would be a Farmington School District, a West Hartford, a Bridgeport, New Haven. So um, it was established in the late 70s. It's a state mandate that requires the Department of Children and Families Commissioner to provide educational programming um, for youth in uh, our residential facilities. Um, so currently we have um, Solnit North, which is out of East Windsor, um, and then we have Solnit South, which is um, two schools on that campus as well. Uh, in addition, um, the district has expanded over the years where now we have the regional ed services that, that Nachi is here to represent, um, where we had ed consultants and specialists uh, in each region um, supporting the education of our youth uh, within those districts. And then we also have a virtual academy, which uh, was implemented a few years ago. Um, it's, help serving our students um, who are, are transitioning, who might need uh, credit recovery, um, you know, or even academic en enrichment. And we have uh, virtual academy teachers assigned throughout the regions and across the state. Um, and we've also grown to a post-secondary ed uh, unit as well, where we have specialists um, support our youth um, that are in post-secondary ed facilities, uh, and college and university campuses as well. And then also we have a no nexus unit where we have um, students placed at special ed facilities across the state and some out of state. So um, it has um, expanded over time and, um, and evolved and so it's exciting opportunity to, to, to serve the, our youth across the state. And does the USD2 have to comply to the same educational statutes as the district schools, the other um, town and city Absolutely. schools? Absolutely. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are the same as any other school district. So mm -hmm. we have to adhere to all the state mandates, um, the, the standards, the expectations of every school district, the accountability uh, that districts have, um, we have to adhere to. Mm -hmm. So even all the laws, the regulations, um, and the accountability, the reporting, um, we have to adhere to. Yep. Well, that's good to know. And what about the virtual academy? You mentioned virtual academy and the post-secondary services. Can you talk with us about that? Right. So that um, 
those units came on a few years ago, like I said, so, you know, this USD2 was started in, in the late 70s, and so it has, it has evolved, and so have uh, USD2. So, um, in this, this era of technology and, and um, virtual learning, uh, back in 2016, um, the commissioner and superintendent at the time had a vision of really um, having a different approach to reaching our kids, right? Okay. As, a, uh, as districts move to more computer-based learning uh, opportunities, at the time we felt it was a great idea to, to really uh, reach our students through the technology lens. And, and oftentimes districts have uh, credit recovery um, for students who um, had excessive absences, had gaps in learning, um, which really meets the criteria of our kids, mm -hmm. right? With, with sure the does. numerous transitions that happens, um, we know that the gaps occur, um, missing days of school. So this provides us an opportunity to um, have our students, in, uh, our youth in care assigned to a virtual academy teacher. Um, and then have that teacher work with the student to remediate any credit loss, right? So we really target our youth that are in, in high school uh, who may have failed uh, an English one, an algebra one, geometry, um, and have that VA teacher work with them, you know, via online, and also um, pushing into schools and facilities where the students are, are located as well. Mm -hmm. And it's just, a, it's a great uh, intervention tool um, that allows students to to work on advancing, you know, their academics. Um, so there's an application process where our VA teachers work with uh, all the social workers across the regions um, to make referrals for their youth, and, mm -hmm. and then we will uh, assign a VA teacher, and then our VA teacher will work with the, the local school gu guidance counselors to make sure that um, the students are taking courses that are gonna help them towards graduation. And that's the goal, is to remediate and get our, our students um, up to speed with retrieving their credits. So mainly the virtual academy is for children that are having that lapse in education and, and not doing maybe as well as they, they could be right. and needing that extra support. Right, um, primarily, but we also have it for enrichment, right? So if we have students, uh, and we do, who who are uh, academically advanced and say, for instance, this, you know we're going into summer break and, and uh, they don't have any summer school opportunities uh, and they really want to get ahead of, of their next school year, mm -hmm. then, you know, with the recommendation of a s school counselor, um, and, um, you know, if a student is going into their senior year and they want to take a course that may not be offered in their area of high school and we have it in our course catalog, then we would enroll that child and support them uh, as they ramp up for the next school year. Oh, wow, that's great to know yeah. For, yeah. for our kids. Um, so what is the role of the um, the post-secondary? I know you have a few staff that are assigned yeah, to Yeah, so uh, the post-secondary um, education unit is an intimate unit. It's a party of two, um, but they, they, are, they are terrific, and, and they support our youth who, who transition to um, post-secondary ed opportunities and also colleges and universities. So um, um, the year, junior year right now, so they'll review um, the PSC plans that we call that they'll review that they receive from um, area social workers about mm -hmm. um, our youth aspirations for post-secondary uh, opportunities. And, and they will work with those youths, help them transition onto a college campus or university or uh, any type of post-secondary education, mm -hmm. whether it is um, automotive, uh, hairdressing, mm -hmm. um, whatever it may be, they're there to support and, and uh, help them and guide them through um, the trials and tribulations of being on a college campus, mm -hmm. you know, and, and what are their resources and how to utilize it. Um, so it's been great. It, it, it's, you know, typically, you know, with, with DCF, I found we get them to 18, and now when we get to the post-secondary phase, you know, we're here to get them to the finish line. Mm -hmm. So um, we're very proud of that work, and, uh, and, in, and it's inspirational for a lot of, for um, this unit to support our kids who've been through a lot. We were fortunate to have Chris Mirinelli or Chris Scott on our show um, a few right. a few months ago, right. and he talked all about the importance of the the post um, support, the post uh, education support um, that the students need. So it's great to see that we have that intimate unit of two, and, and possibly we'll grow that as the years go on. Right. 
Um, what is the role of the educational consultant in the regions? Well, that role uh, specific to uh, supporting the requirements of our, our commissioner's responsibilities around suitable education services for uh, all children under her supervision. Um, and really uh, what we do is we try to ensure that we provide direct services through uh, joining social workers at school-based meetings, helping social workers to understand uh, educational laws and, and uh, achievement situations for children who are in care or who are receiving services through uh, the department. So it's really three-pronged about direct services, consultation, direct consultation, as well as sometimes uh, in-service and pre-service training. We do provide um, a day of pre-service for our pre-service academy at the Workforce Development Academy, as well as in-service as needed. Mm -hmm. um, but. Um, the crux of the work is supporting social workers so that um, the children on their caseloads uh, have uh, suitable education services. And is there an educational consultant in all of the regions? So we have two people per region. Um, for example, I'm in Region 5, which covers three, um, three area offices, and there are two of us covering that region. Mm -hmm. So there's six of us, um, uh, I mean, uh, 12 of us total for the six regions. That's great for, yeah. for that support. So is the educational consultant role different than a surrogate parent? Yes, most certainly. Um, so while uh, we are uh, working with and as part of the department, a surrogate parent is a, uh, something that's a, from a federally mandated um, program, and they are contracted individuals who work for the State Department of Education. But our children, if they are uh, committed to our commis commissioner's guardianship and require special education services, uh, that's where the surrogate parent comes in. And they work uh, wonderfully uh, with us together in joining, um, aligning uh, our ideas to uh, advocate for children in care who uh, are committed uh, to our commissioner's guardianship and require or may require special ed services. So I know that in the in the regions and in planning for our kids, we have lots of different meetings and, mm -hmm. and planning meetings. Can we talk about what the planning and placement team meeting is? Sure. Uh, the planning and placement team meeting is um, is a requirement uh, under federal law, under federal special education law, and it's about um, about uh, ensuring um, that if a child may require special education that they go through a process for uh, evaluation and determin uh, determination of eligibility. Mm -hmm. In Connecticut we call it a PPT, Planning and Placement Team Meeting. Mm -hmm. Federally it's called an IEP Team Meeting. Okay, so that's the difference. That's the difference. So the difference between a PPT and an IEP? Uh, the IEP itself is the individualized education program mm -hmm. that would come out of the PPT. if, if in in fact, a child was determined to be eligible for special education services under a special education disability category, then that child would require a plan, an individualized education plan that deals with a, a number of things. It presents uh, what the child's present levels of functioning are, and then goals, specific goals and objectives around reading, meeting needs uh, that are identified, needs and concerns that are identified through present levels. And then it also has um, a number of things, the IEP around um, what the evaluation structure is, um, how often a service would be provided. It gets into a rather detailed program, an annual program for a child that needs to be revisited annually and sometimes in between. I see, and it's a great way to keep our kind of finger on the pulse of our kids and their needs. Right. Um, you know, Matt, you've been with us for about a year and a half, you said, and, and there's so many different facets of DCF and so many moving parts and pieces. Um, do you have a vision for your role in as a superintendent of USD2? Yeah, oh, absolutely. I you know, um, I continue to learn every day. I mean, it, you know, the agency is um, is massive. It's 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 a, it's a big agency and I continue to learn every day from, you know, resident experts as Nachi uh, here we have We're very fortunate to have the regional ed folks. Um, I like to consider them, you know, the jack of all trades, right? I, you know, he just touched upon a lot of things that they do, but um, also they, you know, they're able to do they do a lot of work with the State Department of Ed. Uh, not just with the surrogate program, but also work groups around chronic absenteeism, trauma. Um, so it really gives our 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 students a mm -hmm. voice, right? Mm -hmm. So um, there's only a select amount of districts represented in these work groups, um, but 
our partnership and collaboration with the State Department of Ed really brings us to the table and helps us inform uh, future practice that really puts our kids um, mindful of mm -hmm. you know their needs and services so you know our mission how I, I see it is is just you know um, meeting our students where they're at right because um, you know, we receive students with various disabilities, gaps in their learning. Um, so we start off really just getting to know our youth, right? Mm -hmm. um, listening to them, like we had that forum on, mm -hmm. right? listening to them, what are their needs and how are we gonna support them to, to meet their goals and objectives? So um, just really establishing a connection with our kids, each and every kid that comes in, uh, listening to what they, what they wanna do, have the you know, high expectations for them, you know, for ourselves, holding ourselves accountable and uh, helping them get to where they want to go um, in a safe environment, right? So they're coming to one of our facilities. Um, chances are it's, a, you know, one of many stops or a last stop, mm -hmm. like a last resort. So we want to make sure that while we have them that we are improving their academic skills, right? Have a continuous improvement model as, as a district, meeting them where they're at and just improving on, on their skills and then um, keeping, keeping them safe and, and, and uh, maintain their well-being. Um, so I think the, the mission and vision is just really serving our kids. You know, establishing connections with them, and then also improve, um, improving our adult capacity, our talent management. Um, I, th I think as as we move along and and we have staff um, retire um, or transition to another field, that we have the capacity to backfill with talent, mm -hmm. right? And so utilizing, I think, you know, I always say experience is, is the best teacher. So you have mm -hmm. Nachi here with 30 plus years of experience and, and talent that, um, you know, I want to pair him up with mm -hmm. up and comers who can continue this work once we're long gone, right? right? I mean, right. I think that's a, because mm -hmm. it's just the amount of institutional knowledge um, is critical. Right, for us to meet the needs of our students. Mm -hmm. And it helps expedite them being served well. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we have a complete turnover of new folks, you know, it's really gonna set us back to really meeting the needs of our students. So I think the talent um, management piece is gonna be huge for us. Um, but continue to serve our kids and put them in the forefront uh, in improving their skills. So wherever they go next, that they are better for being with us. Um, and then continue that that connection, right, where their next stop, mm -hmm. right, with the VA. If they're having V virtual academy account with us in one of our residential facilities, mm -hmm. that when they transition back to a community school or another facility, that they're attached to a VA teacher. So they still have that connection, that personal touch mm -hmm. going with them. Um, How long have we had the virtual academy? It's been going on three years now. And years. are you able to see a demonstrated um, uh, success rate? And I mean, our kids, I was at the forum on Friday, and yeah. to hear the, the students' testimonies about how important education is, when they were sharing their traumatic stories, the one thing that was, was very um, stabilizing and um, you know, nurturing was was their relationships with their school systems, with right. school. You know, some of the of the students would talk about how they may have been in so many foster homes, or they may have run away from foster homes, um, but they never missed a day of school. Right. So it really showed the importance of that educational um, home for them. Um, are you seeing that the virtual academy is helping kids with transitioning mm -hmm. from? restrictive environments into the community? Yeah, and that's what we want to do is, is really enforce that empowerment, right? Mm -hmm. The empowerment that their education is their own, right? I mean, uh, as we know, with children in care, they have a lot of adults making decisions for them. Um, but their education is their own, mm -hmm. and they own it. So wherever they go, it's theirs. And that's what we want to reiterate, and we just want to support and encourage and give them the tools to access their right mm -hmm. to education in opportunities. Um, so that's why it's, it's, it's important to have our VA folks continue to, to carry that torch with them wherever they go, right? When they have the PSE um, consultants mm -hmm. on a college campus shooting them an email, what about this, right? Our ed folks in the, in the regions, you know, who helped them since they were in second grade, mm -hmm. you know, go through till, till they graduate. Um, those are the, those personal connections is, is what we need. They, you know, a trusting adult, mm -hmm. and that's what we want to provide. 
I appreciate, I appreciate you both being with us today, and I think that the thing that I really enjoyed hearing from you is that empowering the youth to make that decision for themselves, because all of our decisions, their decisions are being made by DCF and social workers. Um, so it's wonderful that they can navigate this system with support, um, but making those decisions. So thank you both for being here with us on Doors to Hope and Healing. Children who are placed in DCF facilities have many complex needs. We learned all about the educational supports provided to our children to ensure that they are receiving the best po possible education. Thank you for watching Doors to Hope and Healing. Before we close, I would like to introduce you to Lewis. Lewis is looking for his forever home. Thank you. Lewis is someone that kind of presents as being shy. It takes a little bit for him to kind of open up in his willingness to share different things. I like science. Bat in cages, ride their bikes, go to the beach and go swimming. I think a family that's able to allow him to be outdoors. Riding my bike, that makes me happy. He definitely has an attachment to personal things, and that's really important to him. He's really good at building things. He's really good at helping with yard work. The ideal family for Lewis would be a two-parent household. I would like a family that has a mom and dad and older brothers or younger sisters. He would need somebody that is able to have the flexibility to be able to be home and he's there to help with the transition after school. I think having a structured environment really helps him. I think knowing, for him to know exactly what's going to happen. So that new family is going to have to be willing to be patient and be able to kind of go on Lewis's pace and, and be able to kind of allow him to just be him. He likes being able to be like the big brother, but he also, I think, would do good with an older child in the, um, in the house so that he has someone to look up to. I think he needs a, a, a positive um, male role model in his life. My important people in my life is my uncle, my aunt, my cousins, my sisters, and my grandma. I think that they're really important to him. He really cares for them. He would love to continue having that contact. Lewis would need someone who has the ability to give him that positive reinforcement almost on a daily basis to kind of help build up his self-esteem and help build his comfort level in, in the home. My idea of family will be love and care.